So I'm presenting Draw Talking. Thank you to my co-authors, Rubeat and Lee from Adobe Research, Haijun Tia from UCSD, and Ken Perlin, my advisor from NYU. So we've always mixed visuals and language together to help us think and be creative and tell stories um, amongst each other. But what if, for example, um, through um, sort of the progress of HCI, uh, we looked at how we've always tried to invent increasingly natural and expressive interfaces. But um, here, the idea of this project is to explore how people could explain things as in a story, even if there were no computer. For, for example, what if a whiteboard could enable you to um, create interactive simulations as part of your live storytelling process? So I looked at sketch-based um, animation and presentations that people have made, prepared, and live performed to sort of look at their patterns. And I've also done, uh, I did a formative study where I asked uh, participants to draw out a personal story or something that happened um, while they're explaining it to me and to sort of get a sense of what those workflows were like. And just a subset of those observations from the paper, um, it's obviously multimodal. People are moving things around, talking and drawing at different points. But um, in particular, uh, people never really talk specifically about an object that they're drawing while they're drawing it always. They'll go back to work on things that they worked on before. They'll kind of update the canvas. So there's this, this idea of flexibility going on as they're going through their creative process. And another thing that's worth mentioning is that um, when we're drawing things, for example, on a canvas, we have this remarkable ability to symbolically represent whatever we're talking about with things that don't even look like the things we're talking about. I mean, for example, we have our own personal notations, like um, here's drawing a house, but somebody else might draw a house differently. So based on all of this, really, the key interaction that I started playing with for this project was what if we name things like we do at a whiteboard, annotation, and so on, within the narrative flow of what we're doing. So here's what you need to know. You do it in two ways in this project. This is a house. Saying this is a thing, this is a thing. These are clouds. Or you directly link things with the pen to text, like that. And it's that simple. The entire thing that I'm going to show you is built on that simple whiteboard-esque narration style interaction. So I'm going to go straight into it. This is the teaser that some of you might have seen. 30 seconds. This is a boy. And this is a ball. Over and over, the boy throws the ball into the water, and then the dog gives the ball to the boy. So on it happens, and you can play with it live. Inter when wind collides with blades, blades rotate. This sort of is Straw Talking, a prototype system that empowers users to build interactive worlds by sketching and speaking while telling stories. So that evolved over time from these observations. Um, of course, rewinding a bit, there's a lot of work in previous literature about interactive sketching, language-mediated interfaces, uh, pro visual programming, and things in between for live presentation. Um, but a lot of tools, they kind of focus on, OK, what if the user wants to make something specific, like for a product? Or maybe they have something in mind that they want to configure at the beginning. But I'm thinking in terms of what if we have this live improvisational creative process where you don't really know where we're going. So what if we get more tools like that? Um, secondly, a lot of interfaces have a lot of power, right? But um, in exchange, we have complexity. So I wanted to think about how to remove that complexity um, in this live scenario to complement what we have already with a lot of beautiful GUIs out there, um, rather than replace them. So in short, the contributions of this work um, are this interaction concept, I'll say. It's really about the control interaction concept. It's about the prototype that I just showed, that I present. And it's also a, a little qualitative study that I did at the end. Um, as well as I want to mention these design goals that really um, capture what I'm going for here. So. The user should always be in control of what's going on in the scene creatively, and the system shouldn't assume things. Because as I mentioned before, a lot of people, they need the flexibility during the workflow. Um, they also need to change things over time, because they change their mind. Uh, they need this fluid, playful feel. And they also need transparency from the system, because obviously speech systems often have this kind of um, error. <laughs> error aspect to them, things will not always go right. And also, in order to extend our natural abilities, uh, this programming-like capability that comes out of exploring um, the, the aspects of the system. So now I'm going to show a longer demo that showcases all the things, uh, talk over a bit, and 
on the top right is a transcript showing exactly what I say in the demo in case I talk over something in the demo. So I want to go. make a windmill I can play with, so I'll start like so. Here. And these are the blades. Here I'm attaching a blade to a windmill. That's and I'll make blade. it so I attach the blades to the windmill. Here there was a bit in the speech that I wanted to use only. This is wind. Now I'm gonna make a I'll make it interact with the windmill somehow. Blow into the blade I'll save it using the save button. When wind collides with blades, blades rotate. Here I'm basing, creating an if statement. Great, it works. Oh wait, it's still going. The system's dumb. I can fix that. Control whether it should stop. After wind collides with blades, blades stop rotating. So great, I fixed that. This is a switch. And now what's sort of developed after this thing is static. System is I wanted also to create sort of my own little and I'll make a wall within this canvas world. This wall disappears. When I press the switch, I create wind at the wall. When wind appears, wind moves right. And now it's just this chain reaction thing that's going to keep happening as I build up the scene. Uh, hold on a second. I want to make. Uh, I want to make a wind. But anyway, that sort of develops into more complicated things that I played with in language, like what if we can use the adjectives to change the behaviors of what their actions are. For example, if you're happy, maybe it increases the speed and the jump height. Or in this example, maybe I want to play with a behavior by making this butterfly. This butterfly is slow. Slow. Um, but maybe I don't like it, so I can just change it immediately. Actually, let's not make it slow after all. I'll get rid of that. Which ties into the flexibility and editability that I'm trying to go for. Or you could make your own verbs, like a flicker of a light bulb in terms of other verbs. This one flickers two times because I said flicker means the, the two times. So I control that. And there are lots of other demos in the paper. I really invite you to take a look also on the website on the QR code at the beginning. So for example, I can make a game of Pong that transforms in the, into the breakout game with similar mechanics. That actually works. Um, you can also create this sort of like day-night cycle with uh, ghosts transforming into villagers and so on. Very game prototypey. Or even further, now you have like this friend that collects treats for you to increase points and so on. But for those interested in more educational um, applications, I've also explored things like, oh, let's visualize the, the mathematical properties of an object with different labels or um, chemistry lessons in a computational notebook kind of thing. Now, another aspect of this project, as I mentioned, you need to be robust to errors in in the speech input, because that's a thing that happens, and you want to be able to trust that the system is doing what you want. So as part of the design, there's this chain of uh, UI elements that I devised here. So you can edit the text transcript as you're speaking to select parts of what you want very quickly, for example, if something goes wrong. You have this visual on the top left that represents what the system understood when you gave it a command, so it tells you what objects it selected, and you can change them if it got it wrong. Um, there's this whole workflow. Again, look at the paper, it goes into detail. But it looks kind of like this. Ape jumps on the building. Oh, it picks this building, but maybe I want the other building. So I do a quick multi-touch and boom. Um, it selects it and then it proceeds to do the command on the correct object. Very simple, even if it got it wrong initially. Also things like, oh, maybe it didn't know a verb existed, so it's picking another one, uh, or giving you options to pick another one uh, that could be applicable in this case. And sort of lastly, in the legs of this project, I explored how to use language to help you with more editable editability options like uh, um, copying and pasting faster by searching objects by query or introspecting on the rules you created and turning them on and off. Like maybe you want to see what happens if a rule you made, it, you made um, is turned off. I will mention the limitations, of course, here um, because you've probably w been wondering from that slide about uh, picking verbs. Uh, there is a closed set of kind of structure to the sentences that you can say and the vocabulary and somewhat the system behavior even though you can sort of compose the behaviors together. 
And maybe that leads to the question, oh wait, uh, why didn't you use like a language model? Because actually I didn't use a language model at all, just traditional uh, NLP with uh, procedural methods. I didn't use it um, because, number one, it's in the paper, definitely read it because I think it's an important discussion. But um, <laughs> they, they kind of have this unpredictable characteristic when the whole point of this project was to give the user control over the entire process step of, at the time, every step at the way and um, be able to correct things, introspect. Um, and that technology, at least for now, was not there yet. Um, and also I really wanted that interactive time feel, which was also not there yet. I would say that they're excellent to maybe incorporate in the future um, as a complementary thing, but really it was about the process and that's why I didn't choose. But, and I think it's important to mention. Um, so anyway, after all of this, uh, yes, there was a user study that I made very open-ended on purpose because uh, a lot of people might, depending on their backgrounds, use this or think of it in different ways, and I think it's useful to explore where this could go. So system feature exploration, discussion-oriented, and it was about one-on-one -on -one with the person kind of going through all the features after they maybe drew five objects of their own to sort of play around with them, tell a story of their own, and there were nine of them. And they all made cute things. Um, of varying complexity using uh, rules. People really liked the ability to sort of set up the logic of the world. Um, discussion. So in terms of the use cases that I mentioned I was looking for by having these discussions, um, lots of them, educational applications, prototyping, games and presentations, um, maybe learning language by having these visuals or having an alternative to visual programming. People really liked being able to tap objects to select them and name them because it just felt natural to them according to their words, um, as opposed to the, the pen linking that I mentioned where that, that's kind of like a fallback mechanism in case the first one didn't work. Also, I'll show four themes that emerged here. Um, people actually thought of draw talking as not just like this individual tool, but rather as like a generic functionality that maybe you could plug into other tools. Um, that are more advanced. So something that wouldn't be vendor lock-in, but more like this general interaction um, concept, which is great. Um, also the idea of mixing visuals with language um, was useful to some people. And some of the game designers that I, uh, and students that I uh, talked with, they uh, felt it was close to this direct manipulation paper, paper prototyping approach to coming up with ideas, um, except more computational, um, which was interesting. And lastly, uh, this quote I, I really liked because this person doesn't program at all, but they felt that this gave them ac like accessibility to programming like tools without that knowledge, which I think is very motivating. Anyway, I'm closing with mo uh, uh, future work. You know, people said that this could be like a control mechanism for other tools, uh, regardless of 2D, 3D, game engine, or what have you. Um, I would say that for Gen AI people, the best way might be to incorporate it where the Gen AI like translates like very fragmented, rushed input that a normal system wouldn't understand and turn it into something a procedural system could understand. That could be an interesting direction for control. Um, and I am very interested in testing with like actual like full audiences, like more social interaction. But anyway, that's the end of the talk for the most part here. I just want to close with, you know, we're all building um, really wonderful interactive tools, and I just want uh, this to be a representation of, okay, here's another approach to doing things that maybe take steps towards more natural um, interfaces towards um, extending our natural creativity and um, ways of doing things. And I'd love to talk with you about where to go next. Thank you so much. Hey Carl, uh, genitals from Apple. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this scales. Like you did show some examples, obviously that have a lot of objects in there. Is there like a like a a a, a, lar a certain number at which it gets unwieldy, or um, a certain number of objects? Okay. Um, well, it's sort of like a game engine, really, where the underlying implementation will probably determine how many objects. If you're tr talking about the user experience. Um, that's why I started incorporating things like being able to search objects by name so you could find them if they got lost somewhere out on the canvas. So I thought of that kind of thing. 
I would say also I, I took into consideration like information hiding, like only being able to show arrows to things that you were currently interested in as a technique. I started working on that. Um, in terms of performance, it would probably be just like a regular system game engine where you have to optimize as tons of objects appear, but um, yeah. What that's about that's number of rules? Like do rules conflict ah, okay. and things like that? Uh, so currently, I, I mean, it, it would be based on the sort of system implementation, um, but I would say I haven't hit a bottleneck yet. I think I'd have to do a lot of testing, but I, I suspect it would be very much like a visual programming language bottleneck, like Unreal Blueprints or something like that. I can talk with you later about this kind of stuff because I have secret slides, <laughs> like this one. Um, hi, this is Prerna. Uh, I'm at MIT CSAIL. Um, I come at this from an education approach, uh, so that's why I wanted to talk about that. I'm wondering if you guys have thought about like some of the creative scaffolds that you might need when you're maybe having like younger kids try this out. Uh, I think what I'm trying to think of is um, like they may not be the best at like giving that um, like input, um, and I'm wondering if there's like a push and pull interaction with the system that can enable them to use the tool effectively. Is the teacher involved in the scenario? Just curious if there's like some yeah future direction in that space. Uh, so so to understand correctly, you're, you're talking about sort of discoverability of how to use the system? Um, that, and I think with uh, kids, I think some of the things that we have noticed uh, with some of the systems that we have deployed is um, there's this like push and pull interaction with the system to keep them engaged okay. throughout because if it's like very open-ended, kids lose interest very fast. So curious if like that's the space that you're interested in exploring through the educational applications. Yeah. I see. So, so I can attest to the fact that when I was doing the study, like so it is something you have to learn due to the structured nature and the fact that the verbs are kind of like, they are built in to an extent. But like even when people were getting things wrong, they would keep trying different things and pretty quickly arrive at the correct way of okay. saying things. I didn't really see a lot of frustration. So I okay. would be curious how um, <laughs> our, our youngest would yeah. re react to it. And it, I, I haven't built in a specific scaffolding yeah. for onboarding in the system. There's like a manual right now, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I would be interested in seeing like how you could sort of onboard in yes. an interesting yeah. visual way using speech. But I'd love it to be more like a parent guiding their kid okay. sort of thing rather than machine doing this, you know. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah.